Hello, students. This story is called The Bracelet, and it's by Yoshiko Yoshida. The story is about a girl named Emmy and her mother em and Emmy's friend, Lori, who gave her a bracelet with a gold heart. Let's begin our story. Emmy didn't want her big sister to see her cry. She wiped the tears away quickly, but she couldn't wipe away the sadness inside. It's almost time to go, her mother called, and Emmy knew they would have to leave their home soon. Emmy closed her eyes and tried to remember how her house looked. She could even remember how the whole house looked if she closed her eyes and kept pictures of it inside her head. Emmy and her family weren't moving because they wanted to. The government was sending them to a prison camp because they were Japanese Americans and America was at war with Japan. They hadn't done anything wrong. They were being treated like the enemy just because they looked like the enemy. The FBI had sent Papa to a prisoner of war camp in Montana just because he worked for a Japanese company. It was crazy, Emmy thought. They loved America, but America didn't love them back, and it didn't want to trust them. Emmy ran to the door when she heard the doorbell. Maybe she thought a messenger from the government would be standing there, tall and proud, and buttoned in a uniform. Maybe he would tell us it's all a mistake and we didn't have to go to the camp after all. But when Emmy opened the door, it wasn't a messenger at all. It was her best friend, Lori, who was in the second grade with her. She hadn't come to walk to school with Emmy, and she hadn't come to ask her to go roller skating. She came with a gift, as though she'd come for a birthday party. Here, she said, giving Emmy the gift. It's a bracelet. It's for you to take to camp. Lori helped Emmy put on the bracelet. It was gold with a heart dangling on it, and Emmy loved it the minute she saw it. I'll never take it off, Emmy promised, not even when I take a shower. Lori gave her a big hug. Well, goodbye then, she said. Come back soon. I will, Emmy answered, but she really didn't know if she'd ever come back to Berkeley. Maybe she would never see Lori again. When the doorbell rang, it was their neighbor, Mrs. Simpson. She'd come to take them to the center where all the Japanese Americans were to report. Come on, Emmy, get your things, her sister Rico called. It's time to go. Emmy made sure her gold bracelet was secure on her wrist. Then she put on both her sweater and her coat so she wouldn't have to carry them. They could only take what they could carry and her two suitcases were already full. Each family had a number now, and Emmy put tags with their number, 13453, on her two suitcases. Mama took a last look around the house, going from room to room. Emmy followed her, trying to remember how each one had looked when they were filled with furniture and rugs and pictures and books. They went out for a last look at the garden Papa loved. If he were here now, Emmy knew he would pick one of the prettiest carnations and bring it inside. This is for you, Mama, he would say. And Mama would smile and put it in her best crystal vase. But now the garden looked shabby and bare. Papa was gone and Mama was too busy to care for it. 
It looked the way Emmy felt, lonely and abandoned. When they got to the center, Emmy saw hundreds of Japanese Americans everywhere. Grandmas and grandpas and mothers and fathers and children and babies. Everyone was clutching bundles and suitcases tagged with family members. Some people were crying, but most just sat quietly. Emmy's stomach was jumping up and down, and she wondered if everyone was as scared as she was. She touched the small gold heart on her bracelet and tried to feel brave. When she saw soldiers carrying guns with bayonets standing at every doorway, she was so scared her knees began to wobble. Will they shoot if anybody tries to run away, she asked her sister. But Rico just shrugged. I don't know, she said solemnly. Maybe. Since it was time for everyone to board, the, the buses lined up at the curb. They would take them to the race tracks, which the army had turned into a prison camp. As the bus started down the street, she knew so well, Emmy kept her eyes on the window. They passed the Cato grocery store, where Mama used to buy bean curd cakes and pickled radishes. The windows were boarded up now, but Emmy saw a sign still hanging on the door. It said, we are loyal Americans. I am too, Emmy thought. We all are but the army didn't seem to think so. The bus, the bus sped down to the water's edge and crossed the bay bridge, looking silvery in the sun. Emmy glanced at her sister, and then they were at the racetracks. There was a barbed wire fence all around it and guard towers at each corner. Armed guards swung open the gates to let the buses in. They were assigned to barrack number 16. And Papa's friend, Mr. Noma, helped them look for it. It was among the mass of army barracks built around the racetrack. No matter what anybody said, it was dark inside there and the linoleum laid over the dirt had wood shavings and nails and dust. Mama tried to cheer them up. I'll have Mrs. Simpson send us material for curtains, she said. It will look better when we fix it up. But Emmy could tell Mama felt as bad as she did. It was just after Emmy and Rico had set up the army cots that she noticed... My bracelet's gone. Emmy screamed, I've lost my bracelet. Emmy looked at every corner of their stall and along the ramp that led to their new home. It was getting dark outside, but Mama got a flashlight and they walked back along the racetrack, retracing every step they'd taken. But Emmy could not find her bracelet anywhere. It is now time to have supper. Emmy stood with Mama at the end of a long weaving line, each of them clutching a plate and fork. But all she could think of was her bracelet. The next day, as Emmy unpacked her suitcase, she found her favorite red sweater. She remembered how she and Lori had both worn their red sweaters on the first day of school. They'd had matching lunch boxes too. And after they'd gone to fly kites in the vacant lot near home, Emmy could just see their red and yellow kites dancing in the wood, in the wind. And suddenly Emmy knew she was remembering Lori that very minute, right inside her head. Maybe she thought, she didn't really need the bracelet to remember Lori after all.
Mr. Noma came to put up some shelves. The first thing Mama put was Papa's picture on there. Mama said, you don't need a bracelet to remember Lori anymore. Those are things we carry in our hearts and take with us no matter where we go. Emmy knew Mama was right. They would soon be sent to the camp in the Utah desert, but Lori would still be in her heart even there. Lori would always be her friend no matter where she was sent, and Emmy knew she would never forget Lori, ever. In 1942, this is when the story happened, shortly after the outbreak of war with Japan. And, and 40 years later, the, the government concluded, after a long study, that there had been injustice done to Japanese Americans and that the causes of the uprooting were race, prejudice, war hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. Six years later, the United States government finally officially acknowledged the injustice that had happened and made symbolic restitution to those Americans of Japanese ancestry whose civil rights had been abrogated. The bracelet story.